Awesome. Thank you. It's so good to see you. I'm believing for a great um, expectation this evening as you make some of your prayers bold declarations for 2023. Sometimes you've got to shift from a prayer to a declaration. And, and that's what I'm believing for this evening, um, and that your heart is open enough to the point where you say, God, that promise that was a yes and amen, come on, what are the promises in him? They're yes and they're amen. Some of those promises that you believe in God for, I'm believing that 2023 will be the year you see them fulfilled. Because we can talk about Christmas a lot, that's fine, but this is, in essence, you know, my way of saying to you, let's get set up for 2023. You're going to sing carols and you're going to enjoy Christmas time. Amen. But we need 2023 to be a year of bold declarations of faith and expectation. And so as we come and land the year, for me, this is my last speaking engagement. So this is awesome for the year because it's like wine. You know what I mean? You know, like the wedding you know, he saved the best for last. So this is what I'm excited about. I get to land with pastors, Micah and Aaron over here. And then you get to eat like at the wedding where there's lots of food. And, uh, and I don't know, there's no real wine here, but, you know, we can. There's lots of bottles of water, though. Hey, here's a funny story. So I was at this church, right? And we were, uh, and I was in there, I was doing some consulting for them. And so we were there and they had this big wine fridge. It was hilarious. I've never, never seen anything like that. And then there was a whole bunch of water bottles in it. That was like their water fridge. And I felt like taking a photo and going, now that's real faith. <laughs> and so there, 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 there's a breakthrough, not just in, in the natural things that we need, but there's actually a breakthrough in the miraculous. Yeah. If you take the miracles out of the Bible, it's a very, very thin book. Yeah. Yeah. And so as we speak into this evening, and I'm going to call it Come to the Table, we talk a lot about church and buildings and facilities and meetings, but, but really, we're being invited to a meal, a covenant meal, because we declare promises, but actually, do we know what our covenant is? Yes, we declare all the time. We declare promises, and I already said they're yes and amen. But the covenant and what we believe about the covenant we have access to is actually has a direct correlation to the promises we receive. If I leave you with anything this evening, I'd love for you to catch something, is that we're having a human experience in a sacred narrative. We're really having a human experience. If we're really honest, even the disciples, we're having a very human experience. Like John writes, this is a resurrection of Jesus, beats death outside of time for all of humanity. Just read Romans 6 or Hebrews 7, 8, 9. And outside of time saves the world. And yet John makes sure that he lets the whole world know that he beat Peter to the tomb. <laughs> like for history to remember, Jesus beat death, but I beat Peter. I go, well, there was just such, they were so saintly. No, they weren't. Like have you ever read, so Peter walks on water. Right? That's a great miracle. No one else has ever done it. Most likely over summer, I'm going to have another attempt this year. Because every year I give it a shot. <laughs> but I do it in my bathers. So maybe that's a lack of faith. Maybe I need to be fully, like, fully dressed, ready to go out and try to walk on the water in my parents' pool. But you give it a shot, right? No, I haven't done it yet. But Peter walks on water, probably one of the, the only human being re recorded that walked on water besides Jesus. In the book of John, it says that there was, they were in a boat. Jesus walked on water. There was a storm. They were scared. They thought it was a ghost. Jesus gets to the boat, and suddenly they're on the other side. John's the only gospel that doesn't talk about Peter walking on water. Because we're having a human experience in a sacred narrative. And God goes, that's all right. And so what's your human experience in this sacred story? And the, the, the sacred story is that we get, part, we get to be part of this covenant, this new covenant blessing that directly unlocks promises that are yes and they're amen. So you ready to go on a journey with me this evening? Thank you. 
You ready? I know it's the afternoon, all right? I know what it is to do sessions in the afternoon. But you haven't eaten yet, so you can't be tired. <laughs> May the hunger pains keep you awake while I preach. But let me read you a story, and I think we'll go from there. David Livingston, the first great missionary to Africa, was in the African jungle so long that England, his native country, began to worry about his status. As a result, the English government sent David Stanley to find him. Stanley's search party encountered great difficulties in their travels. They were plagued by disease and starvation, were even threatened by cannibals. At one point, the group encountered a strong, hostile African tribe near the equator. When the tribe showed no signs of letting them pass through their land, Stanley's interpreter advised Stanley to cut a covenant with the tribe to avoid severe peril. Not knowing what else to do, Stanley agreed. First, negotiations were made between Stanley's party and the African tribe. The terms were agreed upon and the ceremony began. A representative was chosen from each group and the two representatives went through the blood covenant rite. After blood was drawn from the wrist of each representative, mingled together and mixed with wine, both drank the mixture, gunpowder, I know, gross, right? Uh, it is. Yeah, then it's mixed, so they had to drink the mixture. And then gunpowder was then rubbed on each person where the blood had been drawn, creating a permanent mark. The priest that officiated the ceremony then pronounced blessings for following the terms of the agreement and curses for violating the pact. This is actually a book um, from the book Unraveling the Mysteries of the Blood Covenant by John Osteen. To seal the agreement, Stanley and the chief exchanged gifts. The chief wanted Stanley's prized possession. Are you ready for his prized possession? A goat that he had brought from England that provided milk for his weak stomach. Can you imagine traveling going, what's your carry on, sir? The goat. The chief offered Stanley a spear bearing his insignia. Stanley wondered what he would do with an old spear. As he traveled through the darkest places in Africa in search of Livingston, he soon found out. When other tribes with evil intent saw the chief's spear in Stanley's hand and his covenant mark, they knew that Stanley was in covenant with the most feared tribe in the land. Further, they knew that if they attacked Stanley or refused him passage, they would not only have to fight Stanley's search party, but also the African tribe in covenant with Stanley. Rather than opposing Stanley, the tribes bowed before him, allowing to pass freely through their territories and provided him with anything he needed. Stanley reportedly used the covenant rite at least 50 times during his travels in Africa. Stanley was a, might was a mightily blessed man because of this covenant. Stanley gave up his comfort for covenant. He didn't know what a spear would do with that insignia. And if we're really honest, we actually don't fully know what unlocking a covenant blessing may look like. But before we get into the fullness of that covenant, sometimes God says, can you give me what you think you'll find comfort in? Are you willing to let go of the goat that helps you with your weak stomach for a spear that you don't fully know what the power is in? And so before we go into 2023, are there things that we have to let go of in 2022 that have kept us comfortable but not in covenant? The things that, you know, it's, we, we go, oh, it's just a goat. But to us, it's mindsets, it's expectations that are lower than God's best for us, that are inferior to our divine design. Things that we, 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 we pray here because we're actually scared because if God actually answered our true prayer and promise, he'd actually scare us. You know, sometimes in life, the scariest moment in life is when God says yes. Like, when, like if we're really honest as well, we eventually complain about what we prayed for. Please, God, give me a spouse. Like, please give me a husband or a wife. Or children. Or that job. And now you've got to get up for it. Or the pays. Not, like we eventually sometimes complain about the very things we prayed about. What is the comfort factor that going into 2023, you can say honestly, God, I'm ready to step into covenant and I'm ready to give my old goat away. What's the goat? Come up, we think about it. What's that goat? Because it's the releasing of a covenant promise 
that unlocks the yes and amen. And I'm believing, same as Lisa said before, those prayer points are real. And they're, in, they're, they're part of our inheritance in the, in the new covenant. So if we can jump to that, if I'm, I'm going to work really well. Thank you. And you have a Star Wars t-shirt on. That makes you even better with technology. That is definitely true. Let's go to the next slide. Jeremiah 31. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new, new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Let's keep reading. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their, in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Let's keep reading. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and their sin I will remember no more. When... Yeah, if you've ever sat down with anyone really intelligent and they ask you a question, it's not usually because they need the answer. They just want to get a, it's kind of rhetorical because they just kind of want to see what your position or perspective on it is. And I remember studying this with Bob Mendelson, who was the director of Je Jews for Jesus Australasia. And he was walking me through these five I wills. And he says, this is the part where the five I wills of the new covenant replace the five I wills of Lucifer. This is the part where in Ezekiel where he says that I will ascend. Sorry, Isaiah, where he says I will ascend the, the mountain. I will have this. I will be like the most high God. And the new covenant, and here's the beauty of it, is that in his five I wills, they were all self-serving. In God's five I wills, they're all generous. Therefore, us, I will be their God and they will be my people it's not self-serving. And so when we live in that place of covenant, we cut off the I wills of the enemy over your life. Because there's a new covenant. And we have access to those five I wills. Let's keep reading. Is the quality of your life is directly connected to the quality of the covenant you believe in. So we can decide every day, am I living in the new covenant or am I going to live constantly back and forward? Like, God likes me today, but he didn't like me yesterday. He likes, he'll like me in a week because I know I've filled up my prayer tank. You know, when Paul writes about getting rid of this, oh, woe to this body of death. But the body of death was a way to torture people in the Roman. When the Romans came up with stuff, they had like a committee of how to torture people the worst. Can you imagine being asked to be on that committee? So how are we going to make everybody fear us more? So the body of death was a punishment that if you murdered someone, they'd strap their whole dead body to you and then either you would go mad and, the, and you'd end up throwing yourself off a cliff or something or the disease in that would eat out and make you sick and you would die. So the, that, that, that body of death was strapped to you. And so Paul talks about this old covenant, this old mindset, this old man as a body of death saying you can't live in both. You can't live in both. So what covenant are you walking into 2023 with? The, it, you, you can't keep putting it on and taking it off and putting it on. It'll drive you nuts and confused. The very definition of anxiety is living in two minds. And what does the Bible say? It says that any man that goes back and forth is unstable in all his ways. And I say this as a leadership consultant all the time. I will happily follow an imperfect leader, I refuse to follow a confused one. Simply because it's the blind leading the blind. I'm not, I'm not looking for perfection. I'm just definitely not following confusion. Let's keep reading. So here we have the covenant ceremony. Now I want to jump into this. I'm going to do it a little bit quickly so that we can fully understand coming into 2023 what you have access to. Is that all right? And you guys like me because this is a church and I am preaching a lot of the Bible. So you shouldn't have a problem with it. There's lots of slides and lots of scriptures, and you can write your notes, and I'll even send you the slides if you really want to, want them. Right. So the first thing is the covenant representatives and the covenant sacrifice. So the covenant representatives, here's what is, is, is really clear, is God didn't cut a covenant with me. He cut a covenant with Jesus on my behalf. We need to be really, I didn't come to this, I, I'm not the representative. Jesus is the representative on my behalf, right? 
Some of y'all, I know you know your covenant stuff. You've been in that island Kurong, you just know it. <laughs> then once the representatives, and they had this covenant sacrifice, and usually it would be this book, big bullock, and they cut it in half, and the two sides would fall, like just like that. And then there'd be an exchange of robes, belts, and weapons, and it means that we change our clothes, and you take my, my, the, my belt held my weapons in it. And so what I would really be saying is my identity is your identity. My weapons are your weapons. You go to war. I go to war, the whole thing. You don't go into covenant lightly. It wasn't like, hey, this is a good idea. Let's go into covenant. That's not the plan. That's not how it worked. Is if, if I made covenant with you, it meant that everything you were a part of, I suddenly became a part of. And vice versa. So then there's a walk unto death, which is the vow. And so these two representatives would walk in a figure eight over these two sacrifices, almost making those two parts become one. Through the entrails, through it all. Like they would be walking through it. And as they're walking through it, they'd be saying a vow, which was also the, the, the pronouncement of blessings and curses. In essence, one of them was... If I break this covenant, may what happened to this animal happen to me. If you keep reading down in Jeremiah 31, you, you realize that it says, and this is the Andrew Stone paraphrase, but it is there, that all of creation and what God did in the heavens, that if he were to break this new covenant, all of it would cease to exist. So if you've ever wondered, does God like me today? Just go outside and have a look. Are the birds still chirping? Are the trees still there? Are the stars still there? You aren't so powerful in your sin management that you can break the new covenant. Because that's, there's two kinds of covenants. There's unilateral and there's bilateral. The unilateral covenant says, comes from God, and he says, I promise it and I perform it. The bilateral covenant says, you do, I do. Right? And so the new covenant is a unilateral covenant that God says, here's your promise and I will perform it. Remember his five I wills? Nothing there says, you better turn up and do something. We just have to have the, the faith in the representative that cut that covenant, right? And so then they'd walk through and they'd do blessings and curses and everything else. Then they'd be a seal of the covenant mark, which went in their hands or it went in their leg. But then they would seal it. In essence, to say, I've been sealed by a covenant. Every now and then we have to remind the enemy when he comes to our families, we've been marked by a covenant. Not just prayers, declarations. No, no, the enemy comes or there's a, there's a, and we've got to realize we live from the inside out, not the outside in. We're covenant-led people, not circumstance-led people. So when a circumstance comes that is not in line with the agreement that God has promised us over our lives, we have to show a mark. We're marked by a covenant. Then there's the exchange of names. Now, aren't you glad that you don't pray for the sick in your name? Because it really carries no power whatsoever. Your ch the church name, your credit card name, your, no name, except the name of Jesus. And so when, when there was a shifting of names, it meant that I, my identity became your identity. That's why when we pray in the name of Jesus, it's not just a cute way to end the prayer. We're actually saying, God, everything I have said and come into agreement with, I am now placing it under your identity and authority. Because prayer is not really about asking. It's more about agreement. Because faith comes through hearing. And so then, what have you heard that you just have to come into agreement with? And then, I love this, the covenant meal. God goes, we're going to do all of that, then we're going to eat together. We're going to sit together at a table and we're going to be one. And we're going to be one. Now, isn't it wonderful to think that every part of this covenant, Jesus fulfilled? He was the representative. He was the sacrifice. He was the blessing. He walked unto death. 
He took the marks in his hands and in his feet and in his side. He would give us his name. And then at the end of it all, when he resurrected, what did he say? He goes, man, I'm hungry. Let's eat. And so when we get together, it's not just about church to have a gathering of people. Actually, it's a gathering to say, let's come to the table. Let's come to the table. May 2023 and the Christian churches um, uh, reach into the community, not just be let's join a church. It's let's come to the table together because there is a new covenant blessing for you and your family. And in that new covenant, there's five I wills that God will cancel out the five I wills of the enemy's agenda over your life. And in those five I wills, if you ever believe that he stops loving you, then you've just got to go outside and see all of creation still there. What do we believe about this new covenant? Let's keep reading. Hebrews 7 says this, by so much more Jesus had become the surety of a better covenant. But he, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. The human efforts of a priest were finished and done away with. There's an unchangeable priesthood, which means he's consistently and constantly praying for us. Let's go to the next slide. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. But he, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Dallas, Dallas Willard, in this great book, um, Life Without Lack, talks about the idea of God existing outside of time. Now, if we're really honest, he has to. He's not bound by time. So I I want you to think about it. That's why the power in the prophetic is this, that when I declare a prophetic word over your great, great, great grandchildren, Psalm 105 verse 8 says a blessing for a thousand generations, that as I'm speaking it here, he's present with them there. God still is in 1854 and 2,320. Josiah was prophesied 300 years before his birth by name. So so what I'm saying is this, is that when we come into a new covenant revelation, we're saying that this is an outside of time agreement where God is blessing us consistently, constantly, because he doesn't die like a human being does. He doesn't get frail like a human being does. It says he has an unchangeable priesthood that is consistently speaking new covenant over us. What do you need from that new covenant? Let's go to the next slide. For the law appoints as high priests men who have weakness, but the word of the oath which came after the law appoints the son who has been perfected forever. Let's keep reading. Let's go to the next slide. What is true of the high priest is what is true of the people they represent. So you've got to ask yourself this question. Is do, does my belief system match up with how God the Father sees Jesus? Because what is true of Jesus is now true of me. So does my worry line up with how Jesus feels? In essence... When you get that bill in your email, do you freak out? And you have to ask yourself, Jesus, are you worried about this? If you, if you get a circumstance that comes left field, which we <laughs> didn't plan on like, you know, for two full years, is it circumstance or is it covenant? Because in my covenant belief, what's true of Jesus is true of me. Does Does Jesus ever feel unloved by the Father? Does he ever feel rejected by the Father? Does he ever have a worry of lack from the Father? Does he ever worry about his his health or well-being from the Father? There is a belief knowing that what is true of the high priest is now true of the people they represent. And there are so many worries and fears that uh, we allow into our worlds, inner worlds, that actually aren't in line with the new covenant. 
but we come into a blessing. What is true of Jesus is now true of me. And if you've been in this faith community for long enough, that's Clark's teaching. It's always what is true of Jesus is now true of me. See, under the new covenant, it is illegal for you not to be blessed. That's a big one. It's a legal document. It's a legal representation. Under the new covenant, it is illegal for you not to be blessed. But I never said happy. <laughs> like, we're really honest. Some of, the, some, some of the, the hardest and toughest seasons, in hindsight, became some of the biggest blessings. But not at the moment. It didn't make me happy that borders shut down. It didn't make me happy that we had different challenges and, and different, even, even if you look at the kingdom in business and everything else, there was such, so much of a shake. It didn't make people happy. But I'm telling you now that under the new covenant, it is illegal for you not to be blessed. And that blessing doesn't always come in the way that you think, just like the miracles don't always come in the way that you think. But it is illegal for you. And that's sometimes, can we, can we just be bold for a minute? In 2023, maybe that's what you got to stand on on January 1st and go, this year is going to be blessed. And it is illegal. And you make the declaration. Don't just pray like in the corner in your heart. You, you make a declaration over your family and over your future and over your children's children's children and over your business. Walk down the halls of your business and everything you can touch. And you say, it is illegal for me and my house and my family not to be blessed. Not to be blessed. That means he can turn all things around for good for those that love him. Romans 8. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant. 1 Samuel 18. I just want to show you this particular storyline so that you see the power of the covenant when you believe it and what it does for the people around you. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan took off the robe that was on him and gave it to David with his armor, even to his sword and his bow and his belt. Why? Because that was part of the covenant ceremony. But then Jonathan falls on the field with his father Saul. David is now king. And then we pick up the story here. Now David said, is there still anyone who is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Then the king said, is there not still someone of the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God? Notice that his covenant wasn't just with Jonathan. It, when you make covenant, it's before God. And Ziba said to the king, there is still a son of Jonathan who is lame in his feet. Let's keep reading. So the king said to him, where is he? And Ziba said to the king, indeed, he is in the house of Mekiah, the son of Emil in Lodabar. Lodabar is the place you don't want to be when you're fleeing somewhere. Lodabar is the lowest of the low. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, had come to David, he fell on his face and prostrated himself. Then David said, Mephibosheth, and he answered, here is your servant. Let's keep reading. So David said to him, do not fear. Every now and then, God is going to send somebody to you to remind you of the covenant he's cut for you. And notice, he doesn't say, ready to have some fun. He says, do not fear. And I want to encourage you this evening. There are promises that you haven't unlocked yet that may scare you. Family reconciliations that you've been praying for. But what about when it happens and they come to your house? Your spirit knows that it's a yes and amen, but has your soul processed it yet? What about when you're, do you know, it's more dangerous in a business season when it's in growth than when you're fighting to survive. What about when your business explodes and now you're trying to figure out do I need two facilities or do I need three? How much staff do I have to put on? And we, think, we pray about it. We pray for it. But here's the moment. Do not fear. For it's illegal for you not to be blessed. 
For I will show, surely show you kindness for Jonathan, your father's sake, and will, re will restore to you all the land of Saul, your grandfather, and you shall eat bread at my table continually. A covenant isn't a one-off miracle. A covenant is you sitting at the table, receiving from it daily, minute, second sometimes, hour, weekly, monthly, it's you sitting at the table consistently and constantly saying, I'm receiving from the new covenant table. Because you didn't earn your place there. Jesus puts your name card at that table. Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And all who dwelt in the house of Ziba were servants of Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he ate continually at the king's table, and he was lame in both his feet. What I love about this particular moment is they don't take out the fact that he was still lame in both his feet. This is the human experience in a sacred narrative. Notice he ate at the table and still had some brokenness in his humanness. But he wasn't hidden, he was now covered. Yeah. It's two different, two different postures. Because when I hide, I have to wear a mask. But when I'm covered, I'm allowed to be loved in my humanness. Yeah. But he had a son. He had a son. Now, he was dropped at a very young age. And there's no good Jewish father that would have let his daughter... Have a child with Mephibosheth. So there's only two ways this son came, out, came to be. Either was a Gentile or a prostitute. And yet, even though his bloodline was tainted, David said, sit at the table. There is a community out there that we all need to reach. And their bloodline might be tainted in our eyes. But are we still handing them invitations to come to sit at the table? Because the Father cut a covenant with Jesus, and that Jesus, that Jesus representation covered everyone he represents. Now it's our job, not just for us to have our seat at the table, but are we willing to hand out invitations for others to have a seat at the table? So the storyline of your past, the storyline of what you thought, the storyline of what your parents made mistakes on, all of that stuff. You can bring your humanness to the table where it doesn't have to be hidden, but it's covered. And isn't that what a faith community is all about? It's about coming to a table where you're not hidden, but you're covered. And that's a new covenant promise. Who's blessed this afternoon? Are you guys feeling all right? I want to finish with one slide, and then I'm going to ask Jimmy to come back up. If we get the next slide over. Romans 4, for what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. He just believed. He just believed God that whatever God said and he promised, God would also perform. Why? Because the Abraham covenant was a unilateral covenant, not a bilateral one. That Abraham just had to say, God, you said it. I'm assuming you'll do it. How simple is that? Like, we're really honest with ourselves. What has God said about your family? What has God said about your business? What has God said about your health and your wholeness and your mental health? What has God, what has God said about your city and your region? We just have to hear it because faith comes through hearing, hearing Romans 10, 17 says. I just have to hear it, agree with it, and let it come to pass. Because that's my righteousness. That's my right standing. Not doing it, believing it. Believing it. And it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. Have you ever tried to help God finish what he said he was going to do? Like, I guess Jesus just needed a little bit of a hand with that one. You know, I just need to help. You know, it, he finished the work. He was every part of the covenant ceremony. He didn't need a human being to help. 
So when we say, I'm going to help you, Jesus, do something you already said you're going to do, it actually works against us as debt. And then we're putting our old body of death on, and it counts as debt, not as grace. But to him who does not work but believes on him. Now, I'm not talking about not working as in being lazy for the record. Like, Proverbs says enough about being lazy. Let's not be lazy. We're not, when we, we outwork good things, but we don't work for good things. Not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly. His faith is accounted for righteousness. Now, look who he describes. Just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. And being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. And therefore, it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now, it was not written for his sake alone, that it was imputed to him, but also for us. Jimmy, can you come up? Let's, uh, let's finish the service. It shall be imputed to us who believe in him, who has raised up Jesus, our Lord, from the dead, who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. Not his justification. Uh, who, who's ever heard the phrase, because preachers use it all the time, is don't you know that the power that raised Christ from the dead now lives in you? Right? We hear it, especially when we're praying for, 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 for things and people and, and, and blessing and breakthrough. Is, don't you? That resurrection power. But we forget that that resurrection power that raised Christ from the dead was our justification just as if we had never, ever, ever, ever fallen short or sinned. Why? Because the thing, the power that had Jesus lying in that tomb and then suddenly waking up was the fact they've been justified. They've been justified. Just as if it never happened. Come to the table. Come to the table. Come to the table. Receive continually from the table. You don't come to the table one day, go to bed that night feeling blessed, wake up, pray for 15 minutes. When you told God you were going to pray for half an hour, then you go, God, I can't come to the table because of 15 minutes. It's almost like God wants to say, shut up and come to the table. Come to the table. Because you don't have to hide. Because you're covered. Because you're covered. And so would you stand up to your feet and let me declare something over you as you come into this end of, this, of a 2022 year and as you launch into 2023. If you have a business and I'm not saying you work at a business. I'm saying you have one and you're registered with ASIC or you, you lead a company. Would you just raise your hand? Like that's, that's you, like you actually have a business. I'm gonna pray for you guys. Um, you might have more than one. Um, and then I'm gonna pray a blessing for and a de declaration over those believing for peace in their house. Who's believing for family and peace and reconciliation? This is all part of the new covenant blessing. We're allowed to pray like this. And then, of course, I'm going to pray for wholeness in people's bodies. But if you have a business in, 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 in you run one, it's part of who you are, would you just raise your hand? And, and I just want to declare some things over you. Um, I have a particular blessing in this area because of my marketplace um, calling. So if, if we can just stretch out our hands to people that have their, ra their, their hands raised. And we're going to declare, Father, right now, we just thank you. We come into a new covenant reality that, that we have access to your prosperity. We unlock right now blessing upon blessing upon blessing. Why? Because this business sits at your table. Lord, we thank you for favor with government. We thank you for favor and conversations and real outworkings, Lord God, of new contracts and new staff. And Lord God, expansion, the prayer of Jabez, 
Lord God, we just thank you that there is going to be expansion and favor over these marketplace kingdom leaders. And there's going to be unlocking of the prophetic. God is going to show you things before they happen. And so, Lord, right now, we just thank you that our frequency would be clear to hear from you and have faith so that we can come into agreement with a new covenant blessing. Lord, we declare it and decree growth, sustainability, and prosperity over every business represented here in Jesus' name. For those wanting, you know, peace in their family and even healing and wholeness in their body, would you just raise your hand? Would you just raise your hand? Come on, if you're believing for that, why don't you stretch out your hands or if you're close enough, put your hand on that shoulder. Father, we just thank you. Lord, that under the new covenant, we have access to wholeness and healing and peace that surpasses understanding. I thank you that we are not circumstance people, but we are covenant people. And so, Lord Jesus, we come under your name, your identity, not our own strength or our belief systems or, 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 or frameworks, but God, you and who you are. And what is true of you is now true in our family. It's now true in our bodies. It's now true in our, uh, in our mental health. It's true in declaring over our families reconciliation, love and peace and joy outside of time to bring a blessing for a thousand generations. And so we declare a new covenant blessing that cuts off the agenda of the enemy And we declare and decree our agreement that the promises that are unlocked by this covenant, this new covenant, that you promise and perform, that it is yes and amen. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen and amen. Hey, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate you all so much. I can't wait to hug some of you and a bunch of you that I know well. But uh, I'm going to hand it back to Jimmy and uh, then we're going to just go from there.